Hi, welcome to uh, NEMA 2016 in Dubrovnik in Croatia. Uh, we've got a three-day event happening over here. Uh, yesterday we had the Risk and Regulation Summit, and one of our keynote speakers that we had there was uh, Dr. John Holzman, who's a political expert. Um, John explained to us that, that we've got quite a few risks that are being posed to us within the European region and the world at large in the next one to three years. John, I was hoping you could share again with the viewers who, who didn't manage to make it to, to Brobnik this week. What do you see as the main pressure points that, that we should all be looking to address within the next one to three years? I think the main problem, Andrew, is, is that despite the fact there are a multiplicity of risks, it isn't the fires that worry me, it's their own firemen. Uh, that the Europeans and the United States certainly are not coordinating responses to order the planet. If you look at Syria, that's very obvious. If you look at China and its rise, that's obvious. Frankly, even if you look at the Euro crisis, that's incredibly obvious. There is not a coordinated response. Um, Europe is utterly preoccupied with its existential problems with the refugee crisis. We're playing a war game to that effect later today. Uh, and with the Euro, the United States is increasingly in the grip of populism. And because of that, these, these fires are burning uncontrolled. Now they're very low, but they are burning uncontrolled. And if you see that from Ukraine to China to ISIS to the world economic crisis, that's what really worries me. You, you had alluded to the fact that ISIS, you felt, was perhaps not the biggest threat now that it was a year ago. Where do you see this playing out um, over the coming uh, few months or, or years, indeed? Well, I mean, if you, the Pentagon numbers are pretty clear that ISIS has lost 40 percent of its territory in Iraq. Uh, it's lost about 16 percent in Syria. Uh, it's lost a lot of its money. Uh, we've been bombing the storages where they actually keep money and blowing it up, literally. Uh, because it loses territory, it can't sell oil. And so it's in really bad shape. The, the problem is that ISIS was destroyed once before. It used to be Al-Qaeda in Iraq. General Petraeus comes in, Great Lawrence of Arabia plan. It works. It's gotten rid of. It kills Zarqawi, its leader. And then it comes back. Because if you don't solve the politics in the region, if Sunnis are disenfranchised in Iraq and in Syria, as they were, it'll just come back in another more virulent form. So what worries me isn't that we can take care of it. It's a second-order military problem but it's a first order political problem, and that's what worries me. If we don't deal with the politics, and we're not, this will just come back. The, the whole um, ISIS situation that's playing out in the Middle East, is, as we all know, has, has caused massive displacement of people. A lot of that is the refugee crisis that we do have now happening in Europe and in, in the wider region. Um, how do you see that panning out in terms of European alliances and, and p potential pressure points? We already know about some, but where do we see this going? I think that's, that's a great question. Again, if we're worried about the internal workings of the United States and Europe, the refugee crisis is existential. If you can't control your money and your borders, you're not a great power. I mean, and right now there's a real doubt that the Europeans can control either. The plan at the moment is to bribe Turkey to be the night watchman for Europe. Now, Turkey doesn't like that for all kinds of reasons. It wishes it were in the EU. It's been waiting forever. Erdogan is much more authoritarian than he used to be. The Europeans don't like that, but they have to work with him. 3 billion euro a year at the moment for the next two years, and then we'll see is sort of the, the plan. Um, it's worked in the short run, but there are two problems with that. One, will Turkey continue to go along with this? Very much a risk. I'm not sure, I'm not certain why if they're not paid. As he says, I'll put them on buses. Mm -hmm. You know, he, they can turn the pressure point on and off literally. Um, and the second problem is refugees will merely come another way. I mean, if they can't get through Greece and Turkey, they're going to come as they did through Lampedusa and up the Mediterranean through Africa. And so until you sort out these problems, they will find a way to get there. At the moment, Mrs. Merkel has some breathing space and her numbers have improved as a result of there being fewer refugees, but that's a temporary fix. Nobody thinks this crisis has been solved. So th these are the, the big pressure points. Um, are there any bright lights in terms of alliances globally that, that we should be celebrating? There are, um, and, and as you say, I think we get to doom and gloom in the multipolar world. There are all kinds of interesting things going on. India is a huge positive. This is a country that's now growing at 6 to 7% instead of 4 that desperately wants to do more with the West, that desperately wants more integration with both Europe and the United States. It's a huge upside, and that 7% can become 9 very easily if they have a common market. India isn't a common market. And if they just do that and do nothing else, it'll move to 9 without them doing anything. So India is a huge positive thing. The frontier markets in Africa, broadly, are an incredibly positive story nobody talks about. Look at Rwanda, absolute hell on earth, Dante's Inferno. 20 years ago, now growing 7, 8, 9%, stable government, actually trying to solve some of the problems of the region. I mean, this is a step forward. And so there are all kinds of positive things to be said about the world from frontier markets to disaggregating emerging markets. I mean, China, 
for all the talk, is still growing at 5 or 6%, numbers Europeans would kill for. So there are all kinds of opportunities out there. And we want to integrate the Chinese into this global system so they become stakeholders. So far, they are. So, so far, so good. There are plenty of good stories out there as well. Brilliant. That's good to hear. We can rest assured. <laughs> John, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thanks.